good day, good day to you all. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this session, which is called uh, Novel Approaches in Mind Action, which I'm facilitating in my capacity as president of the 19th meeting of the state parties to the Anti-Personal Mind Bank Convention, which will be convened from 15 to 19 of November of this year in The Hague. I hope you will also join us for the international session, which uh, the intersessional meetings, which will take place from the 22nd till the 24th of June, and they will take place in an online format. Innovation is one of the three teams, together with capacity building and inclusivity, that the Netherlands has chosen to focus on during its presidency. Innovation is a key pillar to the progress in the Netherlands. Apart from embracing innovation at home, we believe in the power of innovation abroad as well. This certainly applies to the mine action sector. Innovation is a key component for progress towards our mine action obligations. Allow me to provide some examples in mine risk reduction and education programs in which innovative ideas to provide these programs in conflict situations should be further explored. Also, new digital technologies can be used for mind risk education purposes, such as the use of social media and cooperation with social media companies. In the area of mind clearance, we advocate the development of new technologies to make mind clearance more effective, but also to improve land releasing methodologies. On the retention of stockpiles for training purposes, we would like to encourage countries to use new technologies, such as 3D printing, to substitute live mines for so-called dummies. This allows us to destroy all mines retained for training purposes in a country. These examples show how important innovation can be for the mine sector. Hence, I'm thrilled to moderate the panel on novel approaches in mine action, as it is a subject matter is so closely linked to one of the key priorities of the Nellis presidency of the 90 meeting of state parties to the Anti-Personal Mind Bank Convention. With that brief introduction, I will now turn to our panel. And in the interest of time, we have five panelists and only one hour. So um, also with respect to the Q&A, I have to ask you to put the cues uh, in the uh, chat box uh, and we will then uh, forward them to the speakers. So we have the following distinct, distinct uh, panelists. First, Mr. Eric Tollefson. He's the head of the Wet Weapon Con Contamination Unit of the ICSC. Previously, Mr. Tollefson spent almost two decades working for the GICSD and MPA, conducting missions across four continents. Prior to that, he served as an ammunition technical officer at the no in the Norwegian Defense Forces. Second, we have Ms. Marta Isabel Hurtado Granada, who is currently the Deputy Commissioner for the Grupo de Ascension Integral Contra Minas Antipersonal of the Office of the High Commissioner for Peace in Colombia. Ms. Hurtado is a lawyer with more than 70 years of experience in providing legal advice to national and international organizations, including on methods related to human rights and international humanitarian law. Ms. Tammy Hall, head of the standards and operations at the GICHD, leads a team that supports the development, dissemination, and implementation of national and international mine action standards. Ms. Hall, who served as head of DGG until 2016, has worked in mine action since 1998 with various organizations, including AMAS, UNDP, and OAS, and the Canadian Foreign Service. She has been based in several time effective countries and has supported many more through her work. And then finally, Dr. Jose Schultz, head of division of humanitarian assistance operation of the German Foreign Office. During his distinguished career, Mr. Schultz has worked on key German foreign policy issues, including by serving as the head of the International Energy Policy Division and the head of the Pakistan team in the Afghan Pakistan Task Force. Before moving in on to the presentations, I would like to encourage you to post questions in the chat, as I said before. To make the most of the limited time we have, uh, you can also like questions other participants ask, 
and I will focus our answers on the most popular questions. If you would like to request the floor, well, unfortunately, that is not possible. With that said, I would like to move to our first panelist, Mr. Tollefson, who has several interesting propositions to share. And I understand that a joint seminar recently organized by the ICSC and the GICSD discussed how technologies developed in other sectors can be used to speed up survey and clearance. I look forward to hearing more. Uh, Mr. Tollefson, you have the floor. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, dear ambassadors, dear uh, directors and distinguished uh, delegates, um, it's a true pleasure to be here today and I would like to express my gratitude for being allowed to present uh, to you how novel approaches in mine action has the potential uh, for enabling a more inclusive uh, workforce, which is also the title of my presentation. Um, before sharing with you why this can be, um, I would like to present to you some of the work of the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, together with its partners, um, have been doing in the field of new technologies in mine action. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the gothic uh, knots that has challenged mine action is uh, that uh, when we introduce new technology, the advantage of an improved probability of detection, or POD, as we say, have uh, resulted in similar setbacks manifested in the increased false alarm rate, or FAR. This paradox has meant that the rate and quality of survey and clearance have not necessarily increased as much as we would have liked. For the past two years, uh, the ICRC, uh, together with Waseda University in Tokyo, has been looking into how the use of deep learning uh, algorithms and artificial intelligence, or AI, could help increase the POD and at the same time reduce the false alarm rate. Next slide, please. Technology for survey and clearance have steadily improved over the past two decades. At the same time, sectors outside mine action have also seen significant progress. The 20th and the 22nd of April, the ICSC and the GICHD hosted a webinar on mine action technology. One of the main aims of these sessions was to foster cross-pollination with sectors outside mine action. Speakers uh, were able to present how technologies for the survey of uh, infrastructure, such as roads and rail lines, could be done smarter and faster. We also saw how the improvement of grain, ground penetrating radars has become a game changer in the investigation of archaeological sites. Such technologies have shown also to be effective when used on land covered with snow. In mine action, we typically uh, suspend survey activities during the winter season. Can we learn from the archaeologist to also speed up survey by using snow covered ground to our advantage? We will try um, in the, the side panel here to put a, a link to the workshop report from the joint ICSC and GICHD um, uh, webinar. Um, thanks for, for putting up that next slide. I would like to uh, draw your attention to the images of this slide. On the top left, you can see a, a popular consumer type drone that we have uh, retrofitted with an infrared camera that is used to detect variations in the temperature between targets and the surrounding environment. The camera of the drone includes a GPS georeference system. This is to accurately pinpoint the targets on a map. The ICSC have, together with our partners at the Waseda uh, University, been working on developing software that can improve the probability of detection and at the same time reduce the false alarm rate. In the remaining images, you can see how we visually can distinguish uh, the various 
uh, AP mines and uh, cluster munition submunitions from the surroundings. Factors like vegetation, soil type, temperature variations, wind, and time of day makes a big difference in performance levels. This approach is clearly not useful for all conditions, but where the factors I mentioned are favorable, it can be a major improvement for survey in areas suspect to contain landmines in ERW. In other words, one more tool in the mine action toolbox. Next slide, please. Lately, we have been looking at the triangle model. The humanitarian sector, in this context, mine action, is best placed to define the challenges we faced with and to describe what success should look like. Academia, in our case, Waseda University, will carry out the research and development for systems and methodologies. And finally, a manufacturer, in our case NAC, will be able to take on the challenge and invest and finalize the development into a product that is ready to be used in the field. The ICSC um, hope through such uh, cooperation that we together with our partners will be able to secure that this approach and technology is being made available to mine action as well as the broader humanitarian sector in the future. Next slide, please. Bringing in technologies from other sectors, as well as introducing smarter algorithms through deep learning or AI, are not limited to making survey and clearance activities more accurate, faster, safer, and more cost-effective. It will also introduce new types of jobs into the mine action workforce. These predominantly field support roles will open for women and men with new competences and skills. Due to the nature of the work, it will also open for people with disabilities as well as for involving academia and other research and development organizations in mine action. In sum, we believe that this will help driving mine action towards a more inclusive and diverse workforce. Uh, I'm really happy to share with you that the ICSC will launch a uh, research paper on inclusion in mine action during the um, APMC intersessionals in June. Um, uh, so so please, uh, please stand by for that, that paper. Uh, so thank you so much, um, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Eric. And I think it was very insightful uh, and interesting to hear also for me uh, as a layman, but uh, how you can make use of these technologies. Uh, this was very uh, insightful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I turn to our second panelist, uh, Ms. Hutardo, who will illustrate how Colombia's Office of the High Commissioner for Peace and the implementation of the peace agreement developed a new approach to ensure inclusion of diverse communities in mine action. Ms. Hurtado, you have the floor. Muchísimas gracias, señor embajador. Muchísimas gracias a todos mis compañeros de panel. Los enfoques innovadores nos ponen retos a las autoridades nacionales para adaptar nuestras intervenciones de acuerdo a las uh, propias adecuaciones de la acción integral contra las minas en cada uno de nuestros estados parte. En particular, me gustaría compartirles hoy la experiencia de Colombia en incorporar el enfoque étnico diferencial en la acción integral contra las minas, en particular en el área de prevención. En Colombia, el, el enfoque diferencial étnico se sustenta en la Constitución Política del año 1991, que reconoce al país como plurietnico y multicultural y consagra los derechos fundamentales relacionados con la diversidad cultural y lingüística la identidad, la participación y la autonomía de los grupos étnicos. En Colombia se reconoce la existencia de tres grupos étnicos que corresponden a comunidades negras, afrocolombianas, raizales y palenqueras, pueblos indígenas y el pueblo rom o gitano. Estos pueblos representan el 9.3% de la población actual del censo del 2018. Next, please. En materia de prevención, el país con el estándar nacional de educación, de educación en el riesgo de minas, cuya versión más reciente entró en vigor en el 2017. 
Igualmente, cuenta con una guía de educación en el riesgo de minas antipersonal desminado humanitario y la liberación de tierras para las organizaciones de desminado. Y cuenta con los modelos de educación en el riesgo en el ámbito educativo y en el ámbito en emergencias. Estos documentos han sido elaborados por la eh, Oficina del Alto Comisionado para la Paz en asistencia técnica con UNICEF. Con el enfoque innovador étnico, se busca que las comunidades pasen de ser receptores de los mensajes de prevención a ser actores de la propia prevención. Hemos logrado formar líderes multiplicadores que pueden realizar réplicas de mensajes de comportamiento seguros a diferentes miembros de su propia comunidad en su lengua y en su cosmovisión. Este trabajo se ha adelantado en articulación con otras entidades del Estado colombiano, como es el Ministerio del Interior o la Defensoría del Pueblo. Esto ha permitido acercarnos a las comunidades indígenas con una formación integral en la cual se abordan temas de prevención y formación del gobierno propio, jurisdicción especial de, las, eh, de los indígenas y los derechos humanos. Next, please. El trabajo en terreno en las comunidades étnicas en Colombia nos ha permitido identificar territorios ancestrales eh, afectados por minas antipersonal. Debido a la dinámica del conflicto actual, las zonas de afectación se han movido hacia zonas de frontera y zonas en las cuales se ubican principalmente comunidades étnicas. En este caso, ha sido fundamental la comunicación y la coordinación previa para constituir significados en torno al riesgo. Esto implica revisar el conocimiento de la historia y la cosmovisión del grupo indígena para ajustar los procesos de formación de educación en el riesgo de minas. Se trata de conocer mejor el grupo indígena con el que se va a trabajar, su historia, su cosmogonía, lugares sagrados y particularmente los ancestrales. En segundo lugar, este tipo de intervención requieren de la preparación de materiales en propia lengua que les permita a los líderes comunitarios ser replicadores de mensajes de prevención al interior de sus propias comunidades. Para alcanzar una comprensión compartida sobre el significado de mina antipersonal, riesgo, comportamiento seguro e identificación de señales de peligro, entre otros conceptos, ha sido necesario prever una estrategia de comunicación que implica saber si el español es comprendido suficientemente por los miembros de la comunidad y si cuenta con el caso de no serlo con traductores que acompañen todo el proceso. Esto es muy importante porque en Colombia estamos hablando que en la actualidad tenemos reconocidas 65 lenguas indígenas vivas clasificadas en 13 familias lingüísticas diferentes. Las comunidades étnicas se comunican a través de estas lenguas, especialmente en zonas limítrofes del país. Este trabajo también implica un constante monitoreo y evaluación que permita hacer un balance de las mismas y el trabajo realizado por los multiplicadores confirmar que los mensajes se estén brindando de manera adecuada y clara y las réplicas se realicen bajo los acuerdos establecidos. Next, please. Ustedes pueden estar observando lo que son los modelos de los afiches en cuatro lenguas indígenas. En este momento tenemos seis lenguas indígenas apropiadas con diferentes materiales, tanto auditivos, visuales como eh, impresos. Finalmente, desde el 2019, hemos destinado desde el presupuesto de la nación más de 1.250.000 dólares para llevar a cabo el enfoque étnico diferencial en la educación en el riesgo de minas. Asimismo, una colaboración de más de 90.000 dólares aportados por el gobierno canadiense para eh, lograr los materiales que ustedes están viendo en seis lenguas nativas. Next, please. También son significativos los envases en desminado humanitario en territorios étnicos. Para ello, hemos ajustado los estándares nacionales de desminado, incluyendo la concertación, como un punto de partida para la descontaminación del territorio y como punto focal para la comprensión de la, incur de la incursión en sus territorios, de los cuales son autónomos, por parte de los operadores y los componentes externos de monitoreo. Hasta la fecha hemos podido avanzar en los territorios étnicos legalmente constituidos de la siguiente manera. De los 749 resguardos indígenas, 164 se encuentran libres de sospecha de minas, 116 se encuentran parcialmente liberados, 156 se encuentran actualmente en intervención, 46 no presentan reportes de minas y desafortunadamente 267 no tienen las condiciones de seguridad actualmente para ser intervenidos. Y de los 202 consejos comunitarios que son de las comunidades eh, afrocolombianas, 
8 se encuentran libres de sospecha de minas, 36 están parcialmente liberados de minas, uno se encuentra sin reporte, 15 se encuentran actualmente en intervención y desafortunadamente 142 aún no tienen condiciones de seguridad para ser intervenidos. Colombia seguirá trabajando en los esfuerzos para que cada una de las comunidades puedan tener una, una apropiación de los comportamientos seguros respetando su cosmogonía y su lengua. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Marta, for sharing Colombia's unique experience. And it's really inspiring to hear how this approach has contributed to changing behaviors in, uh, in, in communities who are so difficult to reach. And I guess, and uh, maybe also in the Q&As, there will be other examples of, of countries which uh, maybe are interested in, in your model. So thank you very much. And now I have the third panelist, Ms. Tammy Hall. Um, she will share the results of the field research conducted primarily in Iraq and Syria relating to the challenges for mine action in urban environments. This research has led to inno innovative solutions that are currently being tested and employed by operators in urban areas. We are very keen to hear from you, Ms. Hall, on these solutions and the outcome of the test phases. You have the floor, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and, and, and good morning, afternoon, evening to um, all the colleagues uh, that are joining us today. Um, as uh, you've just been told, I'll be speaking about uh, innovation in urban areas today. Um, I just, before we start, I'd just like to say, you know, urban areas um, are not new to mine action. You may be asking yourselves why we're talking about innovation in urban areas. Um, but of course, in the last decade or so, uh, we've unfortunately been increasingly uh, dealing with urban areas. And a lot of what I'll talk about today has to do with um, the experience of operators that we've been speaking to and some of the research we did, um, which was mentioned uh, just a moment ago. Next slide, thank you. Um, so let's uh, just situate ourselves here in the urban context. We know that uh, there are a number of key factors that separate it from the urban context. Um, we know that, um, for example, there are um, densely populated areas, and that is, um, you know, a definitely a factor that separates it from rural areas, uh, which makes things a lot more complicated for work on mine action, especially where demolitions are involved, you can imagine. Um, then we look at uh, a large concentration of assets. Uh, this makes things uh, very uh, important to, to get in quickly and deal with mine. Um, contamination, uh, explosives contamination in urban areas. Uh, we've seen the example of Beirut where one explosion destroyed so many assets and people's lives. As well, there are many interrelated area, uh, layers of, uh, of actors, uh, administration, which makes coordination uh, sometimes a nightmare. And of course, we have a lot of major infrastructure present, um, you know, a strategic infrastructure, which, uh, which puts an urgency to our efforts. Just um, to take a look, a step back, uh, you have a picture on the screen um, that looks at an urban area. This is Sinjar in Iraq, and uh, one of the areas that we looked at quite closely. Um, of course, you can imagine um, coordination and planning uh, is a key issue when we look at urban areas. And I would like to focus on coordination and planning in particular, as well as survey, so information gathering in general, when I look at uh, urban areas in the presentation today. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of quick points about some of the challenges that, uh, that, that our colleagues have, have had in trying to deal with these areas. You can imagine um, you, you've got a scenario where you're facing this city and you need to respond to it. Where do you start? How, how do you define your priorities? Um, uh, a colleague some years ago told me about experience that he had where he was asked to roam around the streets of a city and just note down the contamination. Obviously, that's not the way we want to work. Um, and fortunately, uh, technology today offers a lot of uh, improvements on that kind of um, 
an environment. It also allows us to do a lot of work remotely, and that is key as we move forward with um, work in the urban environment. So um, just as a contextual element, um, as was mentioned, um, a lot of the, the conclusions that we've drawn and the early work that we've done on urban environments as related to um, research that we did between uh, 2018 and 2020. In part, uh, some of this work was uh, with MAG, uh, who did an urban approach pilot, which was, uh, I think, quite innovative. Um, and some of the images you'll see will be from that as well. I wanted to highlight uh, what Eric talked about earlier, which was um, the webinar that we did together, uh, where some of this technology was also highlighted. So if we um, take a look first again at uh, urban coordination and planning, we can see that, um, next, thank you. Um, basically, in, in terms of trying to take a first look at sifting through uh, what you could term, I suppose, a, a big data situation where you have a dense environment, as I've said, lots of assets on the ground, where do you start? And of course, we know from um, IMAS uh, 714 that really now we're looking at starting with threat analysis. Um, the image that you see um, is uh, the result of uh, work um, in, in compiling images over time as a time series that allowed a heat map to be developed. Um, this kind of work in compares, comparing a very detailed imagery over time in urban areas allows us to see different different uh, layers of uh, battle damage, which allows us to do um, a tremendous amount of analysis uh, on areas. So you can see here the area that is uh, yellow uh, would be a primary area for focus. Um, and you can do all that without having to deploy assets on the ground. Um, if you can see here, uh, some of these images can be uh, blown up if we have quite good um, uh, image quality, and we can look at doing assessments uh, just from, from photos to figure out what kind of threats we may be dealing with um, and, and what damage may be on the ground. In the case where we have infrastructure damage, we may be making priorities about that uh, right away. And um, if we have uh, data sets that, uh, for example, we can overlay on top of this imagery, we can then look at where infrastructure damage may have occurred. Um, and all of this analysis, I won't go into the details of it. There's a great deal of, 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 of possibilities in terms of what we can do with machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to recognize uh, areas, ground sign um, awareness on, on what, uh, what ordinance may be present in what areas. Um, and all of this allows us to overlay data together to provide a picture. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if we're looking at uh, urban coordination and planning, this is another example of, uh, of data overlay where you can uh, layer different aspects of images onto this uh, very complex urban area. Here we have battle damage, returnee activity and casualty data. Um, and we could be starting right away in this section, in this red section in the corner, instead of wasting our time trying to figure out where we should be going. Um, a tremendous saving in terms of time and resources, I'm sure you can agree. In terms of looking at survey, um, I won't take too long to look at this because I know we're short of time. Um, but if we compare a little bit uh, rural survey from urban survey, we see here a typical scenario where you might be showing up to talk to these uh, informants. Um, and that would lead to the development of uh, different areas. Please change the slide. Thank you. Uh, different SHAs and CHA, CHAs um, that would uh, identify areas that we want to go. We would not necessarily record, however, areas where evidence of contamination was not present. If we look here at a at an urban uh, gridded uh, scenario, this is um, this is from Iraq. Um, it is provided by IMAP, we can see um, that urban areas provide us with um, the possibility to have a ready-made uh, grid. Um, and we can use this uh, framework in order to be able to record areas um, that we visit or that we 
have uh, done analysis in terms of, uh, of our imagery. Here you see in the top right corner where we have identified uh, some areas, and this may be based on visits that were done to those blocks or buildings, as the case may be, uh, where we have the red contamination uh, that was verified as a confirmed hazardous area, uh, where we have the, the green areas, um, they were, there was no evidence there, and we still record that. Uh, so that we can actually have a very good picture of what was visited and not. The confusion in the urban environment can lead to um, assets being visited many times over, um, and that is obviously a waste in resources. This kind of model provides the possibility to move forward much more quickly um, with our analysis. Um, I will mention very quickly another scenario. Uh, in the first scenario, uh, we had um, improvised explosive device contamination um, being in Iraq, where this, where there is no uh, improvised explosive device contamination, we can have different scenarios. And um, one project that uh, GICHD worked on with UNMAS uh, was in Gaza, and sadly, they may be using this tool very shortly, um, which was uh, the ability to do uh, mobile surveys and very quickly uh, do analysis of different areas that had been uh, contaminated had been bombed where there's uh, where there's rubble or evidence um, of damage to buildings and those assessments can very quickly be linked to a centralized database which you see in the corner mapped shared with different actors in the urban environment so uh, just uh, wrapping up here um, of course uh, we've done a lot of interesting work um, we've also seen a lot of, of advances in terms of things that we couldn't get into today in terms of procedures. Um, we are very anxious to continue the work, however, and move forward uh, in some new areas. Um, there's, uh, in terms of information sharing, obviously with this kind of data sets and those multi-layered data sets I talked about earlier, we need to be we need to be linking with all the all the actors that own those data sets. We need to have pre-agreed uh, arrangements with organizations like UNICEF that may have very detailed data uh, that was used, for example, in the MAG pilot project. We need to be able to access this data as quickly as possible, obviously. Um, which will save time and possibly money as we work together with other actors to maybe um, go use common data sets. Um, we need to work a little bit more um, on outreach uh, with the operator community and national authorities to look uh, a bit more at survey methodologies and clearance methodologies uh, to perhaps improve our guidance that we have, in particular on survey inside IMAS, to ensure we have all we need for urban areas. Looking at establishing reporting templates is obviously important, and this information um, management uh, component is key to being able to work uh, efficiently and rapidly in urban areas. I didn't mention, um, but um, we, we are working in a 3D environment in, um, in buildings, and uh, things like elevation modeling, for example, uh, can be done using some of this uh, 3D imagery, um, and looking at how that can be incorporated into reporting templates, for example. Looking at, uh, in general, how new technologies can support uh, land release. Um, here, um, there's a number of, of areas that we're looking at, um, whether that's from um, areas, um, issues like looking at blast uh, distances and calculations for doing um, demolition safely, um, new tools such as UAVs, detection, um, there's a number of areas that we can now uh, move forward with. We still have a long way to go, but I think we can all agree there are many avenues for progress. So thank you for allowing me to take a quick look at some of the progress in urban areas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tammy, for uh, introducing this very interesting and, and promising uh, research, I must say. Uh, with its disproportionately civilian casual, casualty rate and the secondary effects to the destruction of infrastructure, urban contamination is certainly a serious humanitarian concern. Any efforts that can assist in improving survey and clearance in densely populated areas merits careful consideration and our full support. So thank you very much for, for introducing. 
And with the next um, um, panelist, I have to start with an uh, apology since I, I, I forgot to introduce her. And that is Ms. Abigail Hartley, Chief of the AMAS Policy, Advocacy, Donor Relations and Outreach Section. She joins us today on behalf of the Interagency Coordination Group on Mine Action. She has over 15 years of experience with Mine Action, uh, Mine Action work in the UN, including in the headquarters in Afghanistan, and recently served as Deputy Head of the Office for OCHA in Somalia. In 2020, she was appointed Chair of the IMAS Review Board. So, Abigail, uh, most welcome. Uh, you will share with us uh, some innovations in the monitoring and evaluation mechanism, which will keep track of progress towards the goal of the United Nations Mine Action Strategy. The availability of quality data is extremely important to measure needs, impact, and progress. Reliable data collection and accessible information sharing is therefore a necessary investment to ensure progress. So with my apologies, Ms. Hartley, you have the floor. Ambassador, certainly no need to apologize. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to present on this amazing panel alongside some innovative people and organizations. And even though I'm, we're not in person, it's nice to be on the panel with good and old friends. Um, as the ambassador noted, I'm presenting on behalf of the Interagency Coordination Group on Mine Action. And I will talk about improvements, new approaches and innovations that we've brought to the M&E mechanism, which measures the progress of our UN Mine Action Strategy. Next slide. I'll highlight six areas of innovation that have been introduced since the development of the theory of change, which drives the work of the UN in its strategy. Um, indeed, the introduction of the theory of change itself was a new development in the current, composite, current uh, strategy compared to the previous one. Next slide. Uh, the governance structure of the m and &E mechanism is unique. There's a consultative working group which consists of UNDP, UNICEF, UNMAS and UNOPS and the CWG reports to the IACG. The group brings a coordinated approach to our monitoring and evaluation. Um, it ensures partnership amongst participants. It streamline, streamlines the priorities that individual UN entities um, have. And it uses the UN missions that we all carry out to various different countries to support progress. Um, in addition to the CWG, we have a network of country level focal points in over 300 countries. Um, and these people at these focal points have been integral to the success of the, of the country level um, survey instrument. And reporting has greatly improved the focal point share, accurate, complete and, and up to date data and the CWG supports um, at every stage of the participation of uh, or different organizations. Next slide. So the results framework that we use is, a, is an active tool. Indicators are reviewed on an annual basis to ensure that they re reflect changes in the sector and also incorporate findings and feedback from the focal points that I just mentioned and the country level survey into the framework. Um, so the CWG recently developed just last year an indicators progress spreadsheet, which is very user friendly um, uh, document and that's very easy to navigate. And the spreadsheet is also updated every year and is annexed to our annual progress report. Next slide. Using mixed evaluation methods is key to a strong, robust monitoring and evaluation process, especially as in the case for Mine Action, where we're managing complex and large data sets and analysis. So our results framework deals with hundreds of indicators in over 30 countries, which are monitored through the country level survey. Different from, from the previous strategy, um, the current one, which runs from 2019 to 2023, also includes qualitative methods. Um, so we have targeted studies. We undertake two, we, we target to take um, two per year. And this year we looked much more carefully at gender mainstreaming and victim assistance. 
as you will, many of you will know, triangulation is really important and having quantitative and qualitative data enables, enables better triangulation, ensuring that our data is accurate and reliable. So mixed methods enable us to go beyond just the, the snapshot that an indicator, a set of indicator data would show us to identify the reasons behind the data. Um, I guess, in other words, to kind of like tell the story of the data. Next slide. Uh, time trends are really important and they, they, they capture the trajectory of the strategy's variables over time. So using time tra trends enable us to compare data across the years of the, str of the strategy. And you can see, see here data from 2020, which we're, we've already collected and analyzed um, just in the first quarter of 2021 from countries and territories with a UN present mine action presence. So you can see a reduction in casualties compared to 2019. Um, and it's going to be really interesting that we will further an analyze this decre decrease to just see how and whether this was impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The m and &E mechanism functions in a really in complex context, as you all, all of you out there know, um, and, and it will monitor the strategy over its five year time span. So although the annual sh snapshot of progress is very useful to take stock, time trends really do give us a better understanding of the direction that the sector is heading. Next slide, please. The, as I mentioned before, the m and &E mechanism has hundreds, in fact, 600 indicators and a total of 1,020 variables. So it's imperative with such a large amount of data that we have full confidence in, in its quality. So we've made great strides in DQA, data quality assessment, which has really been scaled up during the lifetime of this strategy, especially during 2020, using all kinds of new um, technologies and software um, and data cleaning mechanisms. So DQA is it's very complex and time consuming, but does result in high confidence levels in our data. Um, it improves the re reliability of it and also helps us communicate um, better. Um, the DQA has flagged and, and continues to flag inconsistencies. So we compare responses over time. We look to see if there are outliers or unusual spikes. Um, and we verify the figures, fill in the gaps. This is done in very close cooperation with the focal points that I mentioned before in countries. So if we if we have an alarm bell that something doesn't look quite right, then we can liaise directly with that focal point to solve that problem. Next slide, please. Until last year, we um, reported back results of the m and &E mechanism through an annual progress report that was on the IACG's website every year. But last year, we introduced an m and &E dashboard um, which is a really innovative way for us to display our data and our progress and to help us make data-driven decisions, um, whether that be about program design or the focus of our programs. So the dashboard pre presents key findings in a very simple, colorful, graphic and a very interactive way, which makes our results visual, accessible, transparent and hopefully interesting to question and inquire um, against the data. Um, the dashboard also makes it much easier to observe changes and progress over time. Unfortunately, it needs a Power BI software for me to present it to you. You can, on your own computers, you can easily look at it. But in this virtual setting with all of the different technological platforms that we've got going on at once, it would be really tricky for me to show it to you in real time. Therefore, I'm just going to show you a couple of slides, a couple of screenshots of how the dashboard can be used. Next slide, please. So um, the dashboard enables us to compare key findings across years, as I mentioned. So here you can see information and data from 2020, uh, 2019 and 2018, showing the fluctuation in casualties EOR beneficiaries and mine action funding. Um, it, as I mentioned before, it's interesting to see how the pandemic may have impacted data for 2020. 
And I, I think it'll be really interesting to see annual comparisons made over future years um, to see how did the pandemic um, impact mine action, um, whether these, whether the drop in casualties is an anomaly or, or not. Next slide, please. Uh, the dashboard, as you can see here, the dashboard can also present um, multiple variables at the same time, including by country. So in this example, users can click on the country on the map, and then you can produce data down, down the left-hand side there. I, mean, I know it's small, um, but it would show data specific to that country. And data on the left-hand side, which you probably can't see properly, but that does include casualties by age and gender, the types of devices causing the accident, um, contamination statistics, square meters, uh, number of items, etc., as well as EOR beneficiaries, also uh, disaggregated by gender and age, um, amongst other data sets. Thank you for the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, we can look at multiple variables at the same time. So in this example, I clicked on countries and territories that have integrated mine action in their school curricula. Um, those countries and territories being Afghanistan, Cambodia, Darfur, Sri Lanka, and Sudan. And then I chose to look at the distribution of casualties by age and data, um, age and gender, sorry, <coughs> at the same time in the same, in the same query. So here we can see a decrease in child casualties over the years, suggesting a possible correlation between those two variables. Thank you. Next slide. Another way that the dashboard can be used is by providing an overall picture of um, a set of variables within an outcome. So in this example, I've, I've chosen, uh, we can see, sorry, the different variables measuring progress against strategic outcome three, which, is, which concerns itself with efforts being made towards national institutions leading and managing their own mine action um, functions and responsibilities. So this enables us to very quickly observe that there's a lot of green um, indicating progress, but also identifies the red and where we might need to work harder. So this would be one of the ways that we would use it to consider amending our program design with an effort, of course, to turn more red to green. In the interest of time, I'll conclude here, but I do encourage you to use the link, which I hope one of the uh, one of the technical fairies or elves has put into the um, into the chat, and you could see that um, it would be great if you're a, a donor or a national mine action um, um, director, and you want to look and see what is the progress that the UN is making in your country or across a specific um, pillar of mine action that you're interested in. Um, it would be great if you go in there and fiddle around and, and hopefully you'll see uh, progress there. So we are very proud to have 2020 data already uploaded in, in just the first quarter of 2021. And for this, I would like to thank the M&E team, which is led by Maria Salem and Diane Lonkar, who are genius. Um, the CWG that I mentioned and the focal points from UNDP and Mass UNICEF and UNOPS from over 30 countries. I hope that lots of you are in the virtual crowd and we do very much appreciate you. And of course, just finally to say the UN doesn't make mine action gains without you, national directors and implementers with whom we work in partnership for progress, um, the theme of our meeting. So with that, I'll close and thank you very, very much, Ambassador, for the opportunity to present. Thank you very much and I fully agree with your last words and thank you for your introduction. The m and &E dashboard is certainly a very useful tool to support accessibility of the m and &E data and increases transparency and accountability. And the D DQA process you described is especially valuable. Thank you very much for that. Then we go to our last uh, panelist, which is Jose Schultz. Uh, Jose Schultz will speak about the cross-border programming focusing on Ethiopia, Somalia, and Iran. Dr. Schultz, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, and thank you all the colleagues uh, for their very valuable uh, input for this uh, for this panel. I'm, I'm very happy to participate in this panel number two on novel approaches in mine action. Uh, this is the first national directors meeting that takes place only in an online format due to the pandemic 
Um, and I'm glad to see so many stakeholders joined us from all around the world in this innovative virtual conference. Next slide, please. Novel approaches in mine action became increasingly important last year when we all faced the pandemic and needed to adapt. Within our strategy for humanitarian mine action, innovation is one of four objectives. We want to develop and implement innovative methods, standards and tools together with our partner organizations. Next slide, please. First, uh, let me mention the approach of a country coalition or country conference in which uh, an infected state and a donor join to coordinate mine action in a country. Together with Bosnia and Herzegovina, we had our first country coalition meeting last October with more than 40 stakeholders participating. The many challenges we face in mine affected countries make platforms and meetings absolutely necessary. Through mutual exchange, we were able to gain a better understanding of issues in the affected state. We wish to continue with country coalition meetings in autumn 21, um, hopefully in person again. Last fall, when we had our German annual conference on humanitarian mine action with partner organizations under the motto Innovation and Strategies, our Director General pointed out at our conference that there is a technical and strategic innovations like new platforms, drones, or infrared. In mine action, we can find opportunities to create concepts, to develop procedures, and to tackle persistent challenges. With the input we gained at our conference uh, from the Halo Trust, from HI, and the Ruhr University in Bochum, we decided to move forward and to seek projects where we could include novel approaches in mine action. So far, uh, that's what we found so far. In 2019, we continued funding a project from, uh, from HR, Humanity and Inclusion in Iraq. It started with clearance, risk education and advocacy. In 2020, victim assistance, the fourth pillar of mine action, which we found fund uh, was also included within the activities. For us, that was the first time where we had all our four pillars of mine action included in one single project. Next slide, please. In other areas, HI um, undertakes studies with drones to survey contamination, which may provide for interesting devel developments in the future. For example, there are still many open questions related to the types of environment, uh, for example, urban or rural, or to the detection of IEDs versus legacy contamination. Together, we can join efforts and pave the path towards future development. Exactly, now the, the HALOs, uh, the fifth slide, the HALO Trust. A second uh, idea which was presented at our conference was a cross-border approach. That was what the ambassador just mentioned. A cross-border approach to mine action, which can be of particularly high value when borders are still to be defined. There are many examples of areas where wetland mines are close to borders. One of them is Somalia and Ethiopia. Through one of our projects, survey and clearance will happen in the Horn of Africa. On the one hand, in Somaliland, on the other hand, in Ethiopia. This clearance will contribute to accelerate clearance. We will approach the deadline of a landmine free 2025 in the region with confidence. And we're happy to, for other stakeholders to join the, the efforts and scale up the mining in the region. Next slide, please. Cooperation coordination is essential for advancing our common agenda. As donors, we can support the implementation of novel approaches. Conferences like the NDM help us to gain a common understanding of the challenges which lay ahead. They inspire us to find new ways and to exchange information from which, in the end, affected people will benefit. Partner organizations can also join efforts, share data on innovative mechanisms, and work together in affected countries. Our common goal is to achieve a landmine-free world, in which people are able to live in safety. That means novel approaches to mine action will continue and shape our work in the months and years to come. And for us, it's very important to remain open-minded when opportunities present themselves, not to exclude any approach and to ensure the transfer of information to benefit the entire community. Thank you very much.
short and crisp. <laughs> Uh, and I think there might be uh, still time for uh, uh, one or two questions. So I have one question for Marta. Uh, how have the communities you've engaged with responded to being actors rather than being passive in receiving messages? Do you get any feedback on this approach? So thank you. See. Sí. Eh, bueno, muchísimas gracias por la pregunta. Es una pregunta bastante interesante. En efecto, nosotros eh, seguimos trabajando con las comunidades de manera constante. En este momento trabajamos con 16 comunidades. Con ellos tenemos feedbacks sobre los materiales y también sobre eh, los mensajes recibidos. De hecho, con ellos construimos todos los materiales que ustedes pudieron observar a modo de ejemplo. Y seguimos trabajando porque cada comunidad nos implica un reto diferente frente a la aproximación, eh, la cosmovisión y los lenguajes que ellos tienen eh, para poder adaptar los comportamientos seguros. Thank you very much. And for Tammy, can you elaborate on the reliability of remotely analyzed data sets, such as in the pilot with Mac you mentioned? What additional on site or in person verification is necessary. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, of course, data sets will not be sufficient only. We always need to have follow up by, by teams that will go out. It's really about identifying where those teams should go so that if you have five teams operating in a city the size of, size of Sinjar, you don't have to send them all over the place. But I think in terms of how accurate is that analysis, it's about how accurate your data set is. You know, if you've got very detailed um, uh, satellite data, um, then you, and especially if you have that over time, uh, you can get extremely accurate results. With machine learning, sometimes better results than we might have visually uh, on the first inspection. Thank you very much. And about machine learning, there's a question from Camille Uzun for Eric. Uh, what the term of imag imagining is about artificial intelligence or machine learning? Go ahead, yes, Eric. Yes. Thank you, Ambassador. It's, it's a really good uh, question. Currently, we are working on uh, what is what is known as machine learning, where we're collecting all these data and building up uh, robust databases. But the ambition would be to uh, involve the artificial intelligence as factors such as terrain, vegetation, soil types. There is so much uh, that uh, an AI component uh, would be able for us to, to distinguish the signature of a target uh, and, and be more um, uh, helpful in accurately um, uh, moving things things ahead for the for the future. So, so a marriage of the two. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank, I think we have to wrap up, but this is so interesting. Uh, and as I told uh, everybody, uh, this is the theme, one of the themes of our presidency, uh, innovation. Uh, and I think with all the uh, panelists uh, who gave such an excellent introductions, but there is such a whole world behind this and, and more to say about it. So I think with everybody who asked a question or who wants to ask a question, that we have to uh, continue this dialogue, hopefully soon in person, uh, since we all know that this is an impersonal um, and, and not very friendly way of communicating, but that we can communicate in person, in the rooms, and having coffees and, and site events. So I do hope that also during our presidency, the rest of the year, with, with the panelists, we can continue this conversation with all of you, uh, since this is such an, an innovative way and we can all learn from it and, and improve our, our daily workings. So with that, uh, I want to, uh, to really thank all the panelists and, and give them a, a big applause. Uh, you might not hear it so much from all the others, but I'm sure they're also applauding you. And, and thank you very much. And with that, uh, I go back, I guess, back to Bruno. So thank you very much and much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador and excellent panelists. Um, you are all on time. Excellent content from all of you. Uh, we didn't have much time to take questions, but I will take the, I think I think I have prerogatives, so or I just gave myself these powers to take a few extra minutes to wrap up before tomorrow so people know what to do 
tomorrow. For those who have not been able to say questions or they want to have statements, because this is a technical meeting, as we, uh, as you all know, um, we will we are looking into the possibility of uh, posting your statement on the website somewhere. Um, it was planned, but we, we, are, we are still working on it. That's my point number one for people who are online. Point number two, our apologies because uh, for the sign language did not quite work, so we were not able to use it even though we announced. But uh, this is a good time for me to thank uh, the interpreters um, who work tirelessly, and I'm asking them for some extra seconds. Hopefully, we don't uh, disconnect. Uh, if Daniela could bring me that list of what I sent earlier. So I'd, I would like to thank many of the organizers, uh, the interpreters, because you're there, um, colleagues from Interprefy, the platform. I want to thank our colleagues from New York and Geneva, as well as interpreters from New York. The CICG, we are physically located where we have the conference facilities. It's an online meeting. Is the Centre International de Conférence à Genève. Colleagues from the Hopin platform, we thank you, even though I'm still trying to learn what Hopin can do. Definitely the participants connecting from all over the world. We now have more than 1,100 registered. I'm not very good at math unless somebody can tell me. Today, out, out of the 1,100 participants, 75% came uh, at one point today in your very, very in, in uh, session. So that number is that today we had about 800 participants, which is a bit bigger than we usually have at, um, at uh, the physical space. And my final thanks for the day would be the government of Germany, uh, if I forgot somebody, the government of Germany for their generous contribution to make that uh, possible. Um, definitely, thank you to all uh, organizers. Behind the scenes, we have many people, all the chairs of the sessions. And I'm asking uh, Kayla or somebody else to show me the agenda. Uh, if we can show what will happen tomorrow as we all connect. Um, tomorrow, if you can, Geneva time, uh, this is Tuesday 25. We, can, we have to go on tomorrow, which is Wednesday 26. So if you all connect, Geneva time, 2 p.m., we will have the first plenary, so on the same platform that we are here, on community engagement matters, then we will have three concurrent sessions, one on cash and voucher assistance for clearance, land release, and survivor assistance, one on women inclusion in mine action, uh, challenges and change, and then stage of play linking mine action and the SDGs. Geneva local time, just like today, we'll have a break of half hour around 4 p.m. And then we'll have double um, uh, side events. So the three side events at 4.30 tomorrow will be demining in border areas, uh, enhancing cross-border cooperation and assistance, Managing uncertainty in an explosive hazard contaminated environment and the impact of explosive ordnance on vulnerable people in Syria, but specifically children. And then we will finish tomorrow's session from 5.30 to 6.30 um, on the session on localizing mine action, how to improve, and that will be it for tomorrow. Uh, do I need to say anything else? No. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And I think even though it's an online, we try to make as close as possible to look and feel like together. We really enjoy being with you. See you 
tomorrow, 8 a.m. New York, 2 p.m. Geneva. Thank you for your attention and thanks to all. Goodbye.